Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. You're Lindsay. I am. You are. It's true. <laughs> and a uh, huge thank you. A uh, big thank you to all the Creeps and Peepers who... Uh, either attended the premiere on YouTube of the new stand-up special, Trying to Get Better, or have just been watching it since. And the, uh, as you hear this, it'll be the past few weeks of like leaving comments and sharing it. You know, less than 48 hours out as, as we record this episode, and it's already got over 60,000 views and over 3,000 shares and lots of likes. And the, yeah, so thank you, thank you. I mean, sharing it is the best way, in addition to watching it, to get it out to more people so we can self-fund more specials in the future and do comedy the way that I want to do it, as opposed to having to go through some kind of permission process. Excuse me, can I please do this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's just a thing. If you've been following along, like over the last couple years or whatever, it started with uh, Taylor Swift really like made a big public push to own her own content because her most record-breaking sales album like she wasn't even she didn't even own it yeah and so she's you know redoing that uh taylor's version and now comics and other artists are jumping on that bandwagon of like wait a second why would i let somebody else own what i created yeah so yeah, um, awesome and that's how you can support you know dan and and other artists is just support their self-funded projects like and share and mm -hmm. just help them be artists honestly and thanks for doing that with uh, what we do here too. We've gotten like uh, yeah. Thanks for coming back after like watching his special. Like, <laughs> thanks for coming back to support me. I appreciate it. New listeners, more reviews. We appreciate it. And also excited to announce today. Uh, you know, we mentioned it last week, but again, just hitting the note that we're doing another scared to death live show. <gasps> I'm so excited. Haunted Halloween: True Tales of Hallows Eve Horror Three. Tickets are on sale now. Go uh, go, six, go go. 6 p.m. Pacific time, October the 13th. Friday the 13th is when you can watch. Ichi wow, wow. And that's when we'll be there uh, with you. And then it'll be available to rewatch all the way through November 1st. So you can rewatch on Halloween at moment.co. And again, tickets on sale now. Make your way to moment.co or badmagicmerch.com uh, to get like merch with the show or to also just yes. link to the tickets. Yeah, special limited edition merch. I'm sure that Logan's going to throw in there. Yeah. And just like to clarify, you can watch it as many times as you want up through and including Halloween is yep. what he means by like, you don't have to just wait to Halloween to rewatch no. it. Nope, not at all. It's confusing. And also in the store, <laughs> a Canoe Reeves uh, shirt. <laughs> Yeah, very funny. Uh, uh, last week, I talked about how for, I don't know, the first 20, until I was 20 or 21, I thought that Keanu was pronounced Canoe because I just never heard anybody say his name out loud. God bless you. And that's why I put it together in my head. And then when I finally shared that it was, that I thought it was Canoe, uh, yeah, I got relentlessly teased and people have been laughing about that ever since. So now we have a, a cool ass poster and t-shirt based on how dumb I was. Uh, for a upcoming blockbuster film that will never be made called Canoe, featuring, of course, Canoe Reeves in a canoe. I love it. I love mm -hmm. it so much. Maybe he's eating jalapenos and case. What, what would your dad say? Quesadilla? Uh, quesadilla. Quesadillas. Maybe mm -hmm. he's eating a jalapenos quesadilla. Yeah, he's having some jalapenos and some quesadillas on that canoe. <sighs> it's really cute being from, <laughs> being from the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so cute. And, and that's it. That's, that's it. it. All right. So now story time. Um, how many stories do you have, Lindsay Luhu? Uh, guess. Four. Seriously? Seriously. Oh, wow. Four little snippets? Four little yippets. I love those ones. I know you do. I thought about you when I was putting this together. I have four tales. My first tale is about not looking over your shoulder. Don't look back. But as a rule, like just imagine if mm. somebody you loved and trusted said like, hey, when we do this, don't look back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's uncomfortable. Then uh, my second story, possible skinwalker. Possible. Not sure. My third tale, something I'd never heard of, an Irish banshee. Okay, yeah. Oh, you've heard this? Well, banshees, this? yeah, yeah. Banshees, like, in, in like, um, 
Celtic mythology and stuff, and just like in the in the UK, those the British Isles. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yes, that's where like the the Banshee mythology comes from. Okay, like, you know, like wailing for the dead, I believe. Okay, well then, this story maybe not as surprising to you, but definitely surprising to me as I was working on it. And then my fourth and final story: a doppelganger, maybe like a weird doppelganger story. It's yeah. I'm still having a hard time, like completely wrapping my head around it. All right. A lot, so, a lot of good stuff. Yeah. A lot of yummy, juicy, spoopy stuff. So don't look over your shoulder. Banshee, uh, possible skinwalker. And then what was the fourth one? Doppelganger. Doppelganger. Okay. Lots of stuff. If, if only I had a mirror, it would have been like some of yeah. all your favorite things. Uh, I have two. So shocking. I know. Uh, my first is about a home in San Francisco that was reportedly infested with a lot of paranormal activity for several months in the mid 19th century. An unusually well-documented amount of activity witnessed by many people. And the witnesses do seem to be very credible. Uh, we relied mostly on old newspaper accounts. Wow. For the source material, which is, you know, common on Time Suck, but not common here. My second story takes us to Arkansas, where we explore a haunting uh, set in the unique location of the Plum Bayou Mounds Archaeological State Park. It's a lot of words. It is formerly known as the Toltec Mounds Archaeological State Park. And where is that? It's in Arkansas. Arkansas? Yeah. You guys, I know know it's Arkansas. (laughs) Thank you for the emails, but I I do actually know that it's Arkansas. (laughs) Uh, Are you socked up? Ready to jump into some nice escapist horror story time? Yes, I'm wearing some muted mauve pink and baby blue and white heart fuzzy socks for those of you listening and not watching. (laughs) Uh, So fair amount of setup on this first one, but intriguing setup. Okay. I'll be over here trying not to burp into the mic. Uh, My stomach is very bubbly today, guys. I'll apologize now. Okay. Well, thank God we got a mute button. Well, maybe. Uh, JP Manro was, according to a contemporary, uh, or according to contemporary accounts, not somebody that you would think, uh, you know, you would find in the middle of months of wild claims of paranormal activity. He was a pragmatist, a man concerned largely with numbers and things very much of this world. He was a successful civil engineer with a brilliant mathematical mind who lived in San Francisco in the mid-19th century. He'd previously worked as a civil engineer for New York, New York Railways before making the big transcontinental jump to California. By 1856, he was only 40 years old. In the prime of his life, he'd already completed what would be a very successful business resume for most people. He was sitting atop a financial throne he'd built for himself through shrewd, shrewd investments and now owned a large real estate business. The San Francisco Chronicle wrote about Manro. He was a mathematician of extraordinary ability, a businessman of parts, with a clear and cool head, fine physique, and a frank and open character. It I was, like him. <laughs> it was inevitable that he should become a leader of men. Manro was often mentioned by the San Francisco Chronicle because of the engineering work he did, and he was also known, or also the judge advocate of the Vigilance Committee. The Vigilance Committee was revamped that year, or the the year that uh, this haunting happened, in response to the murder of a journalist named James King, better known as James King of William, a title he gave himself as a teen to seem more distinguished and be more memorable. Uh, King was the editor of the Daily Evening Bulletin. He was known for using the paper to denounce immorality and corruption, and those denouncements eventually got him killed. Just before he was murdered, King had called for the hanging of Charles Cora husband of local brothel brothel owner, Bell Cora. Cora had been arrested for shooting a U.S. Marshal the previous year in 1855. And King wrote that if Cora were to be set free, this error in justice would set a terrible precedent. It would prove that the city was corrupt, and that would, of course, invite further corruption. King warned of the possibility of the jury receiving bribes and accused the sheriff of being influenced by gamblers. And James P. Casey, a friend of Cora's, did not like this coverage. He also didn't like King. In early May of 1856, King's paper had reproduced articles from some New York newspapers revealing that Casey served time in prison for grand larceny. So on May 14th, 1856, James Casey accosted King on Montgomery Street at Washington Street and asked, are you armed? Before King answered, Casey pointed a revolver at him, demanded that he draw a gun to defend himself. Before he even had the chance to do so, he fired a shot that hit King squarely in the chest. And then King died six days later on May 20th. And the Committee of Vigilance soon held trials, finding both James Casey and Charles Cora guilty. And the two men were hanged May 22nd, 1856. And Manro's coverage of the men and all of their conduct is what many credit leading to their hanging. Manro was respected as a truth teller among the residents of San Francisco. 
When he brought up allegations of corruption, people believed him because, because he had a great reputation of being somebody who didn't manufacture facts just to make a story better. And that is why when he made shocking claims of ongoing and incredibly intense paranormal activity, just a few months after the events I just went over, people believed him. Manro often met with two uh, other men at the Vigilance Committee headquarters, 32-year-old Almeron Brooks Paul, a mining engineer, and 32-year-old William H. Rhodes, a lawyer. Paul and Rhodes ran the daily paper, The True Californian, alongside future governor, Washington Bartlett. And one day, J.P. Manro decided to share with these men details of extraordinary events he claimed had been happening in his home. Five years previously, in 1851, Manro built a beautiful house in San Francisco's Russian Hill neighborhood at the corner of Larkin and Chestnut Streets. The house was meant to be a symbol of his family's newfound success, and for several years it was. But then in 1856, it became a source of anger and terror. That year, Mrs. Manro's sister and niece traveled from Hawaii to San Francisco for a vacation, uh, or actually traveled from San Francisco to Hawaii, and then brought back, by all accounts, something evil with them. Shortly following their arrival in the Bay Area to get back home, strange things started to happen all around their house. Objects began to move from place to place without anybody touching them. Windows were witnessed opening and closing by themselves. The family heard unusual and disturbing noises inside the walls that kept them up night after night. Following all this activity, objects began to be seen levitating, flying around rooms all on their own, sometimes even striking people. J.P. Manro narrowly avoided being fatally struck in one instance. He was a near victim of a flying axe attack, barely dodging the weapon which would have killed him had it hit him. Fear of someone being harmed in a future attack is what led him to start talking about the haunting with friends and colleagues. He was desperate to find a way to end the madness. After telling Almer and Paul, uh, it's like a weird name, A-L-M-A-R-I-N, Al Marin, Al Marin. Spell it again? A-L-M-A-R-I-N. I've never seen that one before. Almar and Paul and William Rhodes, the two men decided they would come to the house on September 19th, 1856 for a seance. They wanted to witness the paranormal activity for themselves and a first step towards hopefully figuring out a way to help rid Manro and his family of their torment. The Sacramento Daily Union would soon publish articles on the haunting and the seance it inspired, excuse me, on October 21st, 23rd, and 24th of 1856. And then nearly half a century later, on November 9th, 1902, the San Francisco Chronicle would publish a lengthy account of the paranormal events at the Manro House. At that time, only Al Marin, B. Paul, was still alive. Uh, the article was based on his recollections. The Chronicle wrote that the haunting persisted for four to five months and that the family witnessed paranormal activity at all hours during that time. There seemed to be a persistent and malign influence connected with the house. Acts of spite and mischief and elfish pranks were played in broad daylight. Local papers in still more articles later referred to the Manro House as the House of Demons, because of what occurred during what ended up being several seances. Time now for the tale of the House of Demons. Paul and Rhodes arrived at the Manro house around 8 p.m. September 19th for the seance. Mr. and Mrs. Manro, Mrs. Manro's sister, and her niece were also present. Before beginning, Paul asked Mrs. Manro if she was frightened, and she answered, No. It was rather terrible at first, but we're used to it now. In fact, I confess I am rather more annoyed and indignant than terrified. These spirits, or whatever they are, seem so childish and petulant that I cannot understand it all. If they were really malevolent and inflicted bodily injury for some revenge, it would not be so mysterious. But they do the most inconsequent and silly things. Yesterday I found all the salt had been emptied into the sugar bowl and all the sugar into the salt box. And today I bought an expensive bonnet downtown. When I got home, I laid it upon the piano. The next moment, I turned to look at it again, and just while my back was turned for an instant, every feather had been plucked from the bonnet. How do you explain that? The group of six soon gathered around the table, and once they began to invite the spirits present to communicate, almost immediately, quote, manifestations began to occur. They first heard knocking in all directions. Then the table levitated roughly a foot off the ground. Moments later, suddenly the whole apartment was thrown into commotion. The doorbell rang, sofa cushions were thrown around the room, and all six people felt their hair being pulled, their skin being pinched, and invisible hands, grabbing them simultaneously. Books began to fly around the room, one of them even slammed into one of the women. 
Uh, Mrs. Manro was afraid now if she hadn't seen the type of malevolence that led to an axe flying at her husband before, now she was witnessing it. At one point during the chaos, Paul left the circle to pick up the book that had made contact with the woman and put it on the table. All present watched the book now open on its own. Paul proceeded to close it. Then everyone watched as it opened a second time. It was a travel book, but it opened to a page that happened to contain a Bible verse. And that verse read, Cannot ye discern the signs of the times? What did that mean, they wondered. What were the spirits trying to tell them? Despite the intense activity, the group never fled or called off the seance. They stayed focused on maintaining contact, and soon the group was able to now communicate with the spirit in the house through knocking. Initially, the ghost identified itself as James King, the recently murdered journalist. But when the group asked the spirit about its age and other information, they determined the spirit was not being truthful. When, this, when they called the, the spirit a fraud, the entity now revealed itself as an elderly woman named Capitana, who Mrs. Manro's sister claimed she once met in Honolulu before hearing about the woman's death. They asked Capitana to appear before them. Immediately following their request, a bush outside started to shake against the window. And then the group saw an apparition appear next to that bush for a moment. They ran to the window to take a better look, but the specter vanished. Wanting more proof of the spirit's paranormal abilities, J.P. Manro now challenged Capitana to wake up one of the servants who were sleeping in the stable. The San Francisco Chronicle reported that just a moment later, terrified out of his, out of his senses, the man burst open the stable door with a shriek and rushed in his nightshirt down the walk toward the library window. He broke into the kitchen, and immediately the group of watchers in the window perceived a horrible form appear from the ground in front of them. William Rhodes recounted witnessing this spirit in the October 21st, 1856 edition of the Sacramento Daily Union. He said, This terrible apparition was the most frightful figure that ever the human eye beheld. Language is utterly inadequate to describe it. There it reclined in the clear moonlight, silent, still, and sublime in its horrible deformity. If all the fiends in hell had combined their features into one masterpiece of ugliness and revolting hideousness of continence, they could not have produced a face so full of horrors. It was blacker than the blackest midnight that ever frowned in starless gloom over the storm-swept ocean. Over its head and body it had spread a mantle of the most stainless white. It looked like a robe of new-fallen snow covering the blackened remains of a conflagration. It seemed as though personified sin had snatched the garment of a seraph as he floated by and spread it over its thunder-scarred and hell-scorched form. Its face was turned toward us in profile, and I saw upon its features an expression of cruelty and revenge, darkened by the frown of everlasting despair. Hope never sat there. Rhodes really knew how to uh, paint a very specific and uh, wordy picture. Uh-huh. When the evil figure appeared, all but Omar and Paul uh, ended up fleeing in terror. He later said that he watched the apparition disappear through the wall of the house. As the others ran through the house in a mad dash to escape, they claimed that chairs, tables, rugs, pokers, cushions, and more flew at them. William Rhodes attempted to open the front door and saw that the front gate had been torn apart and used to barricade the entrance. And now they were thus unable to escape. Allegedly, after all that, trapped in this house of horror, the group somehow gathered their composure and continued with the seance. They now asked for kinder spirits to appear before them. It was reported that immediately everyone was softly touched and caressed by many hands. Their hair was smooth, their cheeks padded by hands that became gradually visible, till sometimes a dozen were seen floating about a single person. The group saw these strange spectral hands moving around the table in all directions. Rhodes would tell the Daily Union that he saw the hands for five or six minutes. I beheld the spirit hands quite as plainly as though they had been of ordinary flesh and blood. It is impossible to say, with any certainty, how many of these hands were floating in the atmosphere at the same moment? There were certainly as many as a dozen, and possibly many more. The group decided to end this initial seance around 1 a.m. Paul and Rhodes would return for two more nights and supposedly conduct two more successful seances. The events of the second night were recounted in the October 23, 1856 edition of the Sacramento Daily Union. During this seance, Paul jumped up in fright when witnessing an apparition approaching the window. He said that the figure stood by the window, illuminated by the moonlight, but it was much different from the previous night. No evil demonic form this time. Now it appeared to be a young girl, around the age of 10, who flitted back and forth by the window before disappearing. Shortly following her vanishing, another spirit appeared in the window in her place. The spirit was described as extremely tall and thin, and it was said that it looked more like a shadow than human. Much more terrifying than the girl Mrs. Manro screamed upon seeing it, 
Her scream was directly followed by the apparition entering the kitchen through the wall. The group now saw the spirit standing half inside and half outside the house. And it somehow repeated this act several times before it disappeared. The final night of the seance was recounted by Rhodes in the October 24th, 1856 edition of the Sacramento Daily Union. The group was still in silent for the first several minutes of this additional attempt to make contact before they heard something from under a bookcase in the corner of the room about 10 to 12 feet from the table. The noise grew louder and louder, and then large maps levitated off of the walls and were thrown towards the center of the room. A large globe then rolled off a shelf towards the table and passed beneath it. Another globe flew towards a window hard enough to break the glass. The group now voiced their desire to see the spirits that were in the room with them. And almost instantly, they saw a strange light that flitted like a willow, will o' the wisp. Rhodes recalled that the light first appeared as a large globe lantern, but it was wavy, and oddly, it cast no shadows. The light approached the window, then receded, all while shifting from a floating circle to an oblong figure. It moved back and forth while changing shape, then eventually took on the shape of a grave before disappearing. Later that evening, Paul was thrown from his chair several times. Rhodes recalled almost as quick as thought he was raised out of his chair, and the next moment we beheld him sprawling at full length on the table at which we were sitting and from which none of us had moved. In his attempt to account for this wonderful trick, he says that all he distinct, distinctly recollects about it was that something grabbed him by the collar of the coat whilst something else lifted him from the floor. Then he was lunged forward and finally hurled at full length upon the table. Following this amazing but also terrifying display of spectral strength, this third and final seance was over. No one knew anything regarding why the spirits were in the home, what they wanted, or how to banish them, but they all now believed firmly in their existence. Following these seances, the paranormal activity in the Monroe home allegedly continued for several more months. Then one day, just completely ceased, with no explanation. Just like that, there were no further reports of a haunting. After J.P. Manro died many years later, the house was sold to a man named John G. Klumke, and the San Francisco Chronicle would speculate that Klumke was a terror to unruly spirits. Apparently, he was so scary, he scared away any scary spirits. Klumke lived in the house for several years, never reported any paranormal activity. The house was torn down in 1916. An apartment building was constructed in its place in 1927. Then another high-rise apartment building was constructed in the place of the previous one in 1961, and that building still exists today and, as far as we know, is not infested with any active spirits. Based on the information available, it seems like the Manros never determined the source of the haunting. The Manro House story, another of many examples of a strange, intense, heavily witnessed, and truly unresolved haunting. Hmm, did it happen? And I will say, the skeptic in me, with this particular story, these people were tied to the newspapers. Uh-huh. And there's a lot of newspapers in this area at this time that are trying to get going. Uh-huh. Which does provide a lot of incentive to collaborate and be like, let's sell some papers by manufacturing a wild story. That's kind of what I was thinking. And I was thinking like, oh, well, you know, he's this trusted voice in the community. It's like, well, that could have been pre-planned. Yeah. And, and like, it, a, like a long con. Yeah, and, and it also could have gave, given them, let's say he is that guy, could have given them a lot of incentive to like, hey, man, just go along with this one crazy thing. Right. It's just a ghost story. You know, like, who, who knows? Whatever. Yeah. Not going to hurt anybody. Yeah. Or they all saw some wild stuff. I know. I, well, that's the thing. It's like, how can you know? Who is this? The Capitana. Cap, Cap, that was uh, a. Is that what they think they brought the, back from Hawaii? Well, that, that's what the spirit pronounced it that it was Capitana mm-hmm. after initially saying it was king. And then uh, a, a woman present, I think, uh, said that her sister uh, oh, knew yeah. a woman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 We don't saying, know who she was. Yeah. We don't know anything about her. Nope. Mm, well, maybe we can try and contact her when we're in Honolulu. Oh, yeah. We're going to do a seance now? Uh, maybe. I, I don't know. No Ouija boards, but seances? Maybe. <laughs> Somehow it feels safer. Ouija boards feel dodgier. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, have, I, have, I have two pictures. Okay. Just from the old papers. This first one is an illustration from the uh, illustration of the haunted Manro home from the November 9th, 1902 edition of the San Francisco Chronicle. Damn, that's a big ass house. I know. It is cool to see, like, you know, that Shit. many, many years ago in a now very crowded neighborhood of San Francisco, yeah. they had all this land around their house, like up on top of the hill. Yeah. No, you know, neighbors right next door. <laughs> and then this next one, an old that's cover story. Crazy. These are some cover story illustrations about the haunted Manro home from that same edition of the Chronicle. Okay. That feels aggressive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
front page news. And, and that's, you know, years later when they were just recounting the story. A remarkable ghost story of the early days. The most fiercely haunted house in San Francisco. Let's tell all of our stories in those voices. <laughs> I know. I know. I do feel like, uh, like it reminds me of like early radio when they just yeah. really got theatrical. I love it. Mm-hmm. I wonder if Are you ready for a ghost story? Are you ready for spine-tingling terror? To have your hair raised and goosebumps proliferate upon your appendages? Something like that. Oh, I like that. The shadow knows. (laughs) 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 We could could have some fun with that. Yeah. It's like some weird bonus episode, Mm, all characters. Do it. That'd be actually really fun. I mean, who knows if we'll do this. It's way better than like the Victorian The Victorian England. But maybe it would be really fun to do like an entire bonus episode, at least the stories. Yeah. In old timey radio format. Okay. We'd have to get the guys to even score it a little differently too. Okay. Well, it might actually be hated. It might be a terrible idea. You guys can let us know what you think. <laughs> uh, Annabelle's, Roberts, let us know for those bonus episodes if that is uh, something that you would be interested in or if you're just like, uh, that's a terrible idea. Yeah, please never do that. Please, please, please. We've heard Lindsay's accents. They're not good. It wouldn't even have to be really an accent. It would just have to be just over the top, really overly pronouncing and using unnecessarily long words. And that accent. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's you some said, kind of, You said no accent, and really, then you went right into accent. It's not like an, I don't even know what you would call it. Because it's, it's not in, like. An old-timey accent. Yeah, I guess it is still an accent, yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Just, I just like, yeah, just the theater voice. The- Radi- a- old radio announcer voice. Theater. <gasps> Maybe we get to the origins of DJ Honey. This is like DJ, this is like DJ Honey's grandpa. Great Great grandpa, mm-hmm. yeah. very old man. <laughs> uh, I did think, okay, one of the things that did really throw me that I was like, I don't know, okay. is when they just simply requested a new spirit and then a new spirit came and was kinder and patted their faces. I know the hands I'm thing like, was pretty weird. I'm like, guys, come on, you don't, I just, <laughs> I can't really recall any time a story of people encountering a malevolent evil spirit or some, mm-hmm. or maybe even not even like that bad, but something that's like messing with them in a way that makes them anxious and nervous. And then they're like, you know what? Could you just like tap out for somebody else? We'd, we'd prefer yeah. someone sweet and kind. And then it's like, okay, hold on. And then they just switch places. And now you have sweet, <laughs> sweet hands touching your face. Well, you're like, going to love this. GTFO. I cut this out of the story. You know, with all these stories, you know, it's like, you know, we take like the, Definitely take liberties of like, uh, you know, removing parts that are just boring or whatever. Yeah, like yeah, smoothing yeah. them out or just like read as a little like, what? Um, yeah, anything that could be like confusing or takes you out of the tail. Yeah, yeah we like try laughable. and streamline it. And I will say one of the things I took out of this one from the old newspaper accounts is, okay, during all the hand stuff. Yeah. Oh, did somebody get a massage? Yeah, kind of. Uh, oh. even, even, even better. Sexual? Nope. Oh. Uh, J.P. Monroe said he had a toothache that day and his like Stop jaw it. really hurt and voiced this and some of the little floating hands massaged his jaw for several minutes and then his toothache went away. That's nonsense. That's complete and utter nonsense. That's not how toothaches work, number one. <laughs> you can't massage a cavity away. Maybe a ghost can. Oh my Magical God. ghost. Magic ghost. Magic hands, magic floating spectral hands. Magic dental ghost. It did remind me a little bit. And again, I, yeah, we, we, you know, like who knows, uh, we weren't there, but I will say that like during the mid 19th century and late 19th century, spiritualism was very popular in America. That's when like Ouija boards became a thing. They called them like spirit boards. Yeah. Holding seances was like. It, yeah, it's like what you did on Friday night. It, it reminds me of like right now with all the psychedelic talk, there is like, there's articles in like uh, magazines like adjacent to Marie Claire, if not Marie Claire, about yeah. how it's- Marie Claire, how about, old are you? <laughs> about how like, uh, you know, uh, ayahuasca or, or even like things like that, instead of being like super taboo, it's like what soccer moms and like the, yeah. the dad equivalent are like doing at like little parties. Sure. It was like that in the late 19th century, mid 19th century for seances. Yeah, like parlor games mm-hmm. and all that. And then there was people who had specialized in it. And then like people like Harry Houdini, uh, you know, like some people would get really angry about like, let's say their mom passed, their sister passed. And then these people claim to talk to them. Yeah. And it gives the family hope. And then there are people making money off of that. Which right, are making still money today. off of people's tragedies. Yep. Yes, that's a horrible thing. And so then there became a class of people dedicated to exposing them as hoaxes. Uh-huh. Harry Houdini was one of them. Uh-huh. And the hands and all that, it did remind me of this, like they would use mirrors and they would use certain oh, tricks yeah, to yeah, lift yeah. tables. Tricks of light and all that, yeah. Tricks of light. And, and some people would be very good at that stuff and yeah. they would 
make people think they saw all these things yeah. or even just do weird things like in the dark, have people hiding that would come out of their hiding places and touch people mm -hmm. and things like that. Not saying that that's what happened here, but it, there was a couple like moments where I'm like, hmm, yeah, feels like it could be that. Well, I also think like there, there's the potential that something was there. Yeah. That like they, they had some slight experience. Oh, and they and then they exaggerated just it. exaggerated it for the sake yeah. of the newspaper. Maybe. You know, because I think oftentimes creative strokes of genius like that, you know, mm -hmm. like oh, we can do this. Yeah. Come from one small tangible truth. Yeah, I agree. I'm glad you agree. You, you ready to uh, to leave the madness of the Bay Area in the 19th century and head east to Arkansas? Arkansas, yes. Arkansas? Yes, take me to Arkansas. A uh, fair amount of setup on this one. Uh, there are many, many archaeological sites of interest around the world that have withstood the, the test of time. Uh, this particular site, the Toltec Mounds, also known as the Plum Bayou Mounds. So many words. Have a bit more mystery around their origins than most. According to Plum Bayou Mounds Archaeological State Park, the 100-acre Toltec Mound site in Lone Oak County between the towns of Scott and Keo are one of the largest archaeological sites in Arkansas and also in the entire lower Mississippi River Valley. The mounds were designated a National Historic Landmark in 1978 in recognition of its significance in the history of America. It opened as a state park in 1980. Uh, between 650 and 1050 CE, Native Americans occupying the area built the mounds. And those builders were not actually Toltec. Toltec is a misnomer for the builders of the mounds, first called the Knapp Mound Group. In the 1800s, people thought that the tribes of the eastern U.S. weren't culturally advanced enough to build such monumental mounds and earthworks. The Toltecs and the Aztecs from present-day Mexico, though, they were associated with the building of such monumental structures. And a popular theory emerged that these tribes must have once lived north of Mexico and thus built the mounds. But then in 1883, research by the Bureau of Ethnology of the Smithsonian Institution provided evidence that the mounds were, in fact, built by the ancestors of local tribes and not by Toltecs. However, by that time, the name had already stuck. And in 1888, when a railroad was built near the Toltec Mounds, local landowners named the rail railway station Toltec. And that name, no longer official, continues to be used by many people living in the area. Archaeologists and most others now use the name Plum Bayou Culture to refer to the group of people who built the mounds. And this culture cannot be identified with any of the tribes living in the area in the 1700s. Who this culture was remains a mystery, as does exactly what the mounds were used for. The mounds are situated on the bank of what was once an oxbow lake that was part of a channel abandoned by the Arkansas River. Three sides of the site were bounded by a ditch and 10-foot-high earthen embankment. The site is believed to have been the primary religious center for the people who lived in the area. A few religious leaders most likely lived at the site, and the site was probably used for ceremonies of which we know very little about. Eighteen mounds were arranged around two rectangular open spaces that were used for ceremonies. Today, one mound is 49 feet high, another is 39 feet high, while a third is 13 and one half feet high, and uh, the original heights are unknown. Between natural erosion and some, kind of, and some of the land being used for farming, some of the mounds became smaller or were plowed down altogether. Only one mound has been identified as a burial mound. Some were used as platforms for ceremonies, while others had residences for religious leaders. Several mounds were positioned to line up with the sun on the, on the horizon at sunrise and sunsets on the equinoxes and solstices. The position of the sun on the solstices established times that were important in the annual cycle of activities, both for farming and for rituals. And for reasons unknown, around 1050 CE, the site was abandoned and the Plum Bayou people disappeared. However, later Native Americans continued to use the site for ceremonies or rituals, and many burials took place in the mounds. Now it's a tourist attraction, a place primarily for area schools to send students on field trips to learn about Arkansas's pre-colonization history. Also, it's become a place for ghost hunters and others interested in witnessing paranormal activity. Residents living in the area have reported seeing unexplained lights in the woods near the site. Numerous visitors have reported a persistent feeling of being watched or are being followed while walking along the trails through the park. And several of the homeowners along Bobby Jones Road that run southwest of the mound complex. I don't know why that's funny. <laughs> have reported, uh, in a, it sounds a little bit like Ricky Bobby. <laughs> uh, have reported an array of paranormal activity, including seeing ghostly apparitions, hearing unexplained noises such as chanting or whispering voices, and witnessing objects moving about on their own. Because of all this, Spirit Seekers of Arkansas, a paranormal investigative research team, 
have called the site one of the most active paranormal hotspots in Arkansas. The following is an alleged modern encounter said to have taken place there several years ago. Time now for the tale of fire on the mound. I grew up across the lake from the mounds. When I was much smaller, I didn't think anything of them, except that they looked cool. My dad, a man who has always been a skeptic, never believed the legends, but respected the history of the mounds. I thought my mom was a skeptic too. I wouldn't learn until I was much bigger that my mother was very open-minded when it came to the paranormal. Growing up, she didn't speak to me about the possibilities of otherworldly things coming into our realm, and looking back now, I'm sure it was because she didn't want to scare me or give me a reason to think I wasn't safe. But when I first saw the lights, I didn't feel scared or unsafe, just maybe uneasy. I was 16 when it happened. My sister, a couple of years older than me, was the one to inundate me with all the haunted mounds talk. She told me on more occasions than I wanted how some of our neighbors had poltergeists and how she could hear some of the whispers at night. I thought she was just blowing smoke up my ass and just trying to scare me. Turned out she was serious. One night when all of us were coming home from a baseball game, I saw them. I saw the lights. At first, I thought it was just the setting sun reflecting off the lake, but it was far too uh, it was too far away to be that. From our front porch, we could see the mounds in the distance. My parents had already walked in, my sister trailing behind, when two lights shined from the woods across the pond, the woods that bordered the mounds. Did you see that? I asked my sister. See what? I lifted my arm in the direction of the lights. They were fading, but I could still see their broken glow behind the thick trees. The lights. I'm not falling for that, asshole. No, really, it looks like someone might be over there in the woods. She rolled her eyes and finally looked. Probably just some dumb tourists exploring. But then she seemed to remember at that moment that she loved to torment me with stories about the mounds, and her tone turned dark. Besides, it's not the light you should be afraid of. She said in her best, I hope this gives you nightmares voice. She continued, the lights stay around the forest. It's the shadowy figures that appear at night that could come here that you should be worried about. Whatever. She pushed past me to go into the house. I stayed standing on the porch looking for the lights. I couldn't see them now. Surely if it was someone there with a flashlight exploring, I'd see them exit the woods, right? Were the lights we'd seen the unexplained lights that some of our neighbors had also talked about? I tried not to think too hard about it, but my sister had planted the haunted seed in my head and I had a hard time getting it out of my mind. Finally, after not seeing the lights again and not feeling any bad vibes, I went inside and had a night just like any other school night. Dinner, homework, shower, doom scroll on my phone for a while, and then bed. Uh, I saw the lights a few times after that, always at dusk, never in the dead of night. They didn't scare me, but they did certainly make me curious. Eventually, I decided I would make a trip over there to investigate further, see if I could catch a glimpse of visitors entering with flashlights or not. I didn't want to go alone, but by the time I decided to do this, my sister was already away at college. So I asked two of my cousins, Nick and Ellie, who were visiting from out of town. They were up for a little adventure, so off we went. Ellie was into archaeology and history and all that old crap, so we went a bit early to the Plum Bayou State Park to get some looks at the mounds in the daylight. She made sure to read every podium of information. She actually gasped when she saw the largest mound, the mound me and my sister called Mama Mound. (laughs) So weird, isn't it, that a whole civilization just up and left this place? Must be cursed, Nick said. The chief must have pissed off the priest, and the priest cursed the land or his descendants or something. There's no record of anything like that, Ellie said matter-of-factly. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. Nick and Ellie then argued for several minutes, just like they always did. As we walked along Knapp Trail, there wasn't much out of the ordinary to see. But I felt like the dense woods near the mounds were too dark to look like that in the daylight. I didn't feel anything sinister coming from the trees, though. No creepy feelings or anything. So I just assumed it was still my sister getting to me. About dusk, we hung back while most people were leaving. We sat on the edge of the pond, throwing pebbles into the water, talking to pass the time. I still was hoping to see the lights. I needed to see the lights. More importantly, I needed them to see the lights, to back me up that they were real. Even if they were just flashlights carried by tourists... I just wanted to know what they were and know that I had seen something. But my window for seeing them was closing quickly. The sun dipped beneath the trees and set its orange rays making way for the coming night. I had never seen them this late at night. So after we hung around for, I don't know, about another 30 minutes, I finally admitted defeat. Come on, y'all. This hunt's a bust. Nick groaned. What are you talking about? The night is just getting started. If you want to stay and be ran off or, you know, be detained by the park staff, have at it. Mom's making gumbo tonight. I want to get some while it's still warm. And with that, we all started to head home. 
By the time we got back, it was past 10 o'clock. The three of us couldn't really fit in my room comfortably after eating, so we went to sit out on the porch. My parents were already asleep, so we kept it down, but Nick didn't miss the opportunity to give me shit for nothing happening. I thought he said this place was haunted. That's what everyone says. And then I saw those lights a few times. I don't know. Ellie pointed across the pond. Is that the light you were talking about? I looked over, and it was clear that on top of Mama Mound, somebody had built a fire. Staring at it immediately gave me chills. I didn't know that moment if it was because it was late into the night and looked ominous or if I was picking up on something about it being wrong. But the fire was a completely different beast from the lights I'd seen. The fire made me think I was looking at something secret that wasn't meant for my eyes. No. No, that, no that's not the lights I've been seeing. That's something else. I hope those idiots don't burn down the whole mound. Ellie and I ignored Nick's smart-ass comment. You can't burn down something made out of rock and dirt. And we sat silently, our eyes glued to the fire that looked like it was getting bigger. And then I heard it. We all did. In the silence, we could hear voices coming from the area of the fire, but couldn't understand what they were saying. They carried on the air across the pond. And by the time they got to us, they were more of a cackle than words, like a pack of coyotes hunting in the night. I was really tempted to go inside and wake my parents up. And if the fire had gotten any bigger and spread, I would have. Do you want to go back over there? See what's going on? Hell no, I'm not about to get murdered. We can go check on it in the morning. Might let the park staff know. Have them walk with us. We continued to sit and watch the fire, its glow lighting up the night. And then we started to see shadows in front of it, as if people were standing around it. I was so focused on the fire on the mound and the little figures around the fire that it took me a while to notice something much closer and scarier. There was someone standing near the shore of the pond. I could barely make out their shape. It was a person, or at least had the shape of a person. You could only see the silhouette. Nevertheless, as soon as I saw it, I knew whoever or whatever it was was looking right at me. My skin turned cold for an instant before a wave of heat crashed over me, like I had just been thrown into the fire on the mound. I jumped out of my seat and batted at my skin like I was putting out a fire. Nick and Ellie were asking me what was wrong, but I couldn't explain it. By the time the feeling went away, I, I turned my attention back to the figure on the shore, and it was gone. Forget this shit, I said, getting real freaked out. I'm going to bed. I made myself go in, even though I really didn't want to turn my back on the mound or on that thing by the pond. As I walked away, the crackle of the fire rushed into my ears as if I were right beside it. I shook it off as best I could, went to my room, put my beats on, and tried to sleep. The sunlight woke me up the next morning. I found Nick on the bedroom floor and Ellie passed out on the couch. I woke them both up, told them we should go check out the mounds for evidence of that fire. We didn't even change our clothes, we just hurried over. I expected a small puff of smoke still going from the dying fire, or at least charred remains of wood or whatever else they'd been burning, but there was nothing, no trace at all, of anyone being there last night. Ellie couldn't believe it. What the hell? Did we dream that? All three of us having the same dream? No way. A chill crawled over my neck, and again, I felt someone watching us. I turned to look at the shore, the spot by the pond, where I saw the shadowy figure the night before. I didn't see anything at first glance, but felt the urge to look closer, so I walked over to the shore, roughly to where I remembered seeing that thing. My whole body broke out in chills and goosebumps, when after a few moments, I saw two burnt patches of grass, clearly in the shape of feet. I haven't been back to the mound since. From time to time, I still see the lights, and on even rarer occasions I've seen, or one or more of my family members have seen, the fire on top of Mama Mound. Each time I've seen it again, I've immediately turned away. I don't want to know what will happen if I stare too long, what will happen if I see that shadowy figure again. Was that shadowy figure like a fireman? Like like a like a thing made of fire? Like how could it make those singed footprints? I don't know. I I felt That's like they so were weird. seeing like uh the reverberation or echo, whatever, of some old like sacrificial ritual. Oh. Or maybe someone's getting like burned in the fire or something, some sacrifice to the gods. Oh, I did not take it to that dark place. In my mind, it was, you know, American Indians, like, you know, just performing like their religious types of ceremonies, like mm -hmm. praying to the gods for whatever it was that they needed or wanted. And then they just didn't like that, you know, like people yeah. came in afterwards and, you know, desecrated their land. And a lot of those old rituals from like that era of when the mounds were built. Yeah. Uh, like a lot of those like re religions did involve a fair amount of human sacrifice. No. Yep. I don't like it. <laughs> um, here's some pictures. This first Plum Bayou Mounds Archaeological State Park. So just a kind of an aerial shot of the park, if I recall. 
oh, that's not at all what I was envisioning. Yeah, and that's just one of the mounds. And you can see like just farmland in the distance, you know, like yeah, uh, it's uh, actually little quite homes beautiful. and stuff. Mm-hmm. This, this next picture is, I think this is Mama Mount. I think this is the big mount, judging by the size of it that the uh, author was talking about. I don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting it to be like green and lush. Mm-hmm. Just, I, I was literally expecting like dirt mounds. Yeah, and I don't know if the, I, and I don't know if there's stone structures underneath. Sounds like a lot of it is like like dirt and rock. Yeah, like if they were to, I, I don't think it's like um, Chichen Itza. Oh yeah, or one of those stone things because yeah, otherwise it's not they like would excavate. Pyramid esque. It. It's just no. a mound. But yeah, just this big big mound. Um, this next one, just another pick of the mounds, just another angle. Okay, that's more of what I thought. Maybe yeah. like some of those photographs are just taken at uh, like a time of year where it's just more lush and healthy. Yeah. And like now this is more brown dirt, like probably going into winter. The trees are barren. Okay. And grass has grown over a lot of it. But it's like it, it, it clearly is man-made though. Like it's like. Clearly well, yeah, like, it's like mm -hmm. the shape of it is so. Yep. I don't want to say perfect, but I mean. Yeah, it doesn't flow out of the natural landscape, you know. No, like, no, no. Like, no. Uh, like the. um. Oh, what's it called out by Pullman? Those wavy fields. Uh, the Palouse? The Palouse. Yeah. yeah. Like how like, you know, let's get a whole bunch of mounds, like from glacier melt. Yeah. From glacier going through the area. This doesn't look like that at all. No, no. And then this last one, not a haunted image, but uh, this is a picture of a few people checking out the mounds where you can only see their silhouettes. So it just reminded me of that encounter tale. Oh, okay. Or just. Yeah. Just like a, like a parent like a and two kids or something. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's kind of a cool picture. actually. Yeah. Yeah. So weird. So weird. Well, yeah, because you when when you're talking about like the um, rituals and you know traditions of these you know pre like these religions whatever, but like they were talking about like the equinox and the solstice. Yeah. It's like I, I think it is a reverberation of something around those things, like just There's like praying, ritual. praying for rain, praying mm -hmm. for crops, pray I don't whatever. You know, I'm amazed by ancient astronomers, like how like that was like a common thing in like North America, South America, just all around the world. Yeah. Ancient civilizations with none of our modern tech. I know. But man, they knew exactly where like, you know, certain constellations were and how to build massive structures that had cool connections to solstices. Yep. And to, you know, like sunsets and sunrises, you know, certain certain times of day where the light would, you know, filter directly through this one little hole and hit the, yeah, very cool stuff. It is it is really endlessly fascinating. Like astrology. The, the mathematics uh, like the they had they had to have a firm understanding of a certain like like math in a certain way mm -hmm. and just like geometry to to build all those. And it's just crazy where like they couldn't you know, they didn't have like a drones or anything to look to like look down at what they were making. <laughs> Not that you know of. Yeah, yeah, I know. Just we, we could go ancient astronauts and talk about all kinds of weird stuff. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they really liked crystals too. A lot of a lot of them did. I think they were really into like you know the metaphysical. Yeah. Oh, for sure they were. So, <laughs> just saying, just putting that out there. Yeah. You know, they were into all kinds of uh, magical beliefs. Mm -mm, some some magic. Or yeah. some some things that actually really like, you know? Might be real, might not. Well, mm -hmm. I'm going to go with probably. Okay. I think we should bring back the crystal debate. <laughs> hey, if, I, if I'm going to be open to ghosts, I guess I could be open to like crystals having, you know. Uh, here's the thing. It's like Hear with, with this. all this stuff, there's something very intriguing about it all. And there's, I believe there is stuff out there. It's It's a bummer that it can't be replicated in a laboratory setting. You know, it's like, like that you could like do a test, let's say with crystals yeah, and, uh, in danger, I don't know. And I mean, sad, the kind of experiments they have to do to figure out this stuff, but they do the, do cruel experiments like with animals or whatever. Stop. You have to have a bunch of mice and you'd have to like, some of the mice have crystals that are supposed to protect them mm. and some don't. And then you endanger them and you see like, is there a statistical difference in the in the mice with like the crystals being more protected than the mice without crystals? Oh. Or do they all just get like eaten or smashed or whatever? I don't like that test. Huh? Huh? That's how you find stuff out. Ugh. I don't like to think about it. I'm not good about that kind of stuff. It's like, yeah. I, I know myself well enough to know I would, cannot be, I mean, I could be if I had to be, like if it was a health reason or whatever, but like vegan, vegetarian, it's just not, I love meat. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I say that because it's like so oftentimes people are motivated to be vegans or vegetarians because yeah. not so much about the food. I mean, yes, like how we get the food, but because of other things like experiments yeah. and I just Well it makes you feel better. I don't like to know about that. Call me yeah. ignorant if you like, but it just it bothers me too much. If it makes you feel better, they've done studies 
and determined that a lot of rats are masochists and actually enjoy being experimented on. You stop it. No, they do, they like it. Get Ple- the fuck pleasure through pain. Get mm-hmm. out of here. Dan Cummins. Yeah, you can't trick me. <laughs> they're rat- you were close. You were close. That was the first time that you've like, you know, that was the first time in a long time that you have kept your voice steady and you didn't get that little glimmer in your eye where uh-huh. you're like, oh yeah, yeah watch yeah. this one. <laughs> that would be hilarious. If that was true. Like BDSM rats. <laughs> oh my God. Like some poor rat being experimented on it. He's like, more, more harder. I like it. Oh, I like it. Is that is that a rap voice? I don't know. Just a picture. I like it. It'd be high. Okay, okay. Who's your Layla this week? Uh, I just have uh, one right here. Just the traditional black and white Layla. I, red heart. When we started, I somehow got my headphones caught on something. And so it is just pulling on the back of my head. Oh, no, you're so I'm sorry, I've been real up. fidgety. It's okay. I hope it wasn't too distracting. Hmm. Are you ready? I am. I'm ready well, for four stories. Talking about witches, you're going to love how this story starts. Okay. I am, as my husband puts it, a paranoid witchy psychopath (laughs) with crystals in every corner of our home. Burning sage is a weekly occurrence, along with many other monthly ritual cleansings. And then there's my husband, who doesn't believe in the paranormal and truly believes he can protect our family from any attack with his guns. Mm -hmm. I give him some shit. He gives me all the shit. But in the end, we've both accepted that we're doing what we believe is best to protect our family. Anyways, on to my story. I grew up in Utah. My grandparents would often take my four sisters and I camping. Every time my sisters were with us, we had a completely normal camping trip. My granddad had a few rules we always had to follow while camping. No whistling. No (laughs) sing. I know, it's not funny. No singing after the sun went down. And never leave the campground, no matter what you hear, and especially if it's a crying baby or a woman screaming for help. Being a young child, I assumed he was just kind of pulling my leg and trying to freak us out a little bit. I also knew I didn't want to break these rules for fear of what would happen. My granddad is a large man with a very intimidating presence. So even though he would make us nervous with these rules, I did always feel safe with him. One camping trip, my sisters ended up with a stomach bug and they stayed home. So it was just my granddad and I camping near Blanding, Utah. We loved to go explore the caves, search for cave paintings, and spend hours upon hours just exploring the area. This particular trip, we were out a little a little later than normal. My granddad grew very nervous as he noticed the sun going down while we were still quite a ways away from our campground. I figured it was just because he didn't want us to get lost in the dark. I wasn't worried at all. We'd been walking for about 30 minutes when the sun finally set. Our campground was in sight, though we still had about another 10 minutes to get there. And that's when I noticed the smell. At the time, I didn't have anything to compare it to. But after becoming a mom and having a deep freezer unplugged by my little minions, I knew I now realized the smell was that of rotting meat. I had started to gag. My granddad looked at me and I saw complete terror in his normally very peaceful eyes. He didn't say one single word. He simply picked up his pace as he grabbed my hand while nearly dragging my little legs that couldn't keep up with his 6'4 build. It was dead silent outside. Normally, you could hear at least the trees blowing in the wind, birds squawking, campfires crackling, and families talking around those campfires. But at this moment, I swear I could not even hear my feet hitting the dirt ground. It was truly a deafening silence. A screech that made my granddad stop in his tracks shot through the silence. It sounded like a woman screaming, and yet also sounded so robotic, like someone or something was trying to imitate the sound of a woman screaming. It mysteriously sounded like it was coming from directly above us and also miles away, all at the same time. My granddad looked directly into my eyes and said, do not run. Do not look anywhere but directly at the ground and do not let go of my hand for any reason. He started walking as fast as humanly possible and somehow my little legs were able to keep up. Tree branches were crashing behind us and I wanted nothing more than to look back to see what was making that noise. Seven-year-old me thought I was going to die and if I was going to die, I wanted to know what was going to kill me. Moments before my curiosity got the best of me, I heard something speak. In that same robotic, mimicking voice as the woman scream, I heard my granddad's name being called. Jacob, turn around. I could feel my granddad's palms growing sweaty. I was afraid my hand would slip right out of his. My granddad snapped at me. Keep walking. Don't look back. 
The voice began to sound desperate, growing louder, almost screaming. Jacob, please help me. Jacob, 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 look at me. The smell grew more and more intense. I swore I could feel something breathing down my neck. The branches behind us made a sound of swaying. The voice was getting louder. And then, as soon as we crossed the gate into the campgrounds, everything snapped to normal. No smells, no voice, no noises. The the noise of nature simply returned. I have tried to get my granddad to talk to me about what happened that night, but he refuses to speak about it. All he will tell me is that I need to continue to follow the rules and never look back. And to this day, I don't know what happened to us on that trail. And now 20 years later, I have taught my kids the same rules my granddad taught me. Don't whistle. Never sing after the sun goes down. Never leave the campground, especially after a cry for help. And don't ever, ever look back. Devoted listener, peeper, believer of all things paranormal and crystal lover, Mm -hmm. Alex. Thanks, Alex. I think out of like all the paranormal entities that we go over, a skinwalker might be the one. Like, if I had to, pick, oh, you think that might have been a skinwalker? Well, maybe. Like, um, j- just as far as like you know, mimicking voices and stuff. Oh yeah, because yeah, I yeah. Think that, yeah, I think that's what they do. And like, uh, the the sound of like snapping stuff behind them, like a big creature, mm-hmm. you know, something in some like big animal form, perhaps, is what I, I didn't was, think about that. Where my brain was going, but it's like that might be. Um, if I had, if I got to pick, like, okay, one of these things gets to be true, like for sure, like, like, or which one would I want to, like, if only one could be right away, like, confirmed, like we have yeah. evidence. Skinwalkers just are such a f- interesting concept where it's like a, a shapeshifter and something that, like, like paranormal that way. I don't think I would pick Skinwalker because of the shapeshifting, because then how could you trust anything? It would. Just, I'm just saying in the sense of that it would open up to, like so many magical possibilities to me of like cryptids. Ghosts, whatever, just such a unique entity. I think I would rather just see some floating ghosty apparition. Hmm. Have other people see it. Have it definitely have features. You know, not not just like uh, what what could be dismissed as like a specter or <clears throat> well, specter or um, uh, <clears throat> just like like a like a beam of light. You know, yeah, not yeah, just yeah, like yeah, this yeah, sort like of like you know effervescent. It's like I want shape. I want yeah. eyes, mouth, mm, nose, mm-hmm. you know, like I want features, but soft, gentle, and several other people to be like, do you see that woman floating in the air right there? That like white. Like some lady of the manor yes. floating down the stairs. Yes. That kind of specter. Yeah. But what I don't want is like this thing that maybe looks half human, half animal. Maybe it's shifting into this, into that, because then I'm looking at you and I don't know mm. if you're you anymore. It, yeah. it just creates, it sows too much doubt for me. Yeah, I see. Yeah. That like everything becomes questionable. Everything could be a monster. Are you back in your radio voice? Who knows? <laughs> but I did not even think of it being a cryptid or a uh, shapeshifter, skinwalker guy. I don't know what I thought it was. Yeah. I, I think maybe mostly I thought maybe it was just like some sort of like poor, sad, lost soul that had died out there that was trying to mm. find its way. And the lack of noise thing always kills me. It's like, man, just total... Silent. You know when the forest gets too quiet? Yeah, completely quiet, mm-hmm. completely silent. Mm-hmm. I don't know. No I've never bugs, had that. Ha- nothing, yeah. I've never had that happen, and I hope it never does, because that alone is enough to yeah, terrify me. Yeah, that'd be so eerie. Ugh, no thanks. Okay, well, let's read a story of a possible skinwalker. Yeah. I grew up in advanced North Carolina on the Yadkin River. Yadkin means many trees or big tree. I was told that Native Americans had lived there way back when. My only confirmation of this was the arrowheads, broken pottery, and the stone head of a hatchet I found over the years of living there. This place was also home to some moonshiners many years later, and then finally, my family. We owned 50 acres, some of which was used as a... We, you, heh, I can't speak. <laughs> we owned 50 acres, some of which was used as a horse farm. My loyal corgi, Smitty, was my constant companion here. Smitty often came along with me on late night adventures. I would venture out in the middle of the night on full moons to go down to the river. On the river was a boat ramp that stuck out of the water just enough that you could lie down on it and stare at the endless stars without any light pollution interfering. That was my happy place as a teenager. One full moon, I completed my ritual. I had snuck out and walked down to the river with Smitty as usual. Nothing was strange about that night as I sat on my rock enjoying the sounds of the river and nature surrounding me. After a little while, I grabbed Smitty and walked to a nearby picnic shelter to gaze out at the moon-drenched field. 
I can't tell you what I was thinking about sitting there, and I couldn't say how much time had passed. I was brought back to reality when Smitty began letting out very low barks. It was like he was trying to whisper to me. He hadn't gotten my he hadn't gotten my attention immediately, but eventually I asked him what was going on. What not that he could actually tell me. It was then that I noticed the lack of sound around us. No crickets, no nocturnal life. Nothing at all except the sound of the river. Recognizing the strangeness of silence, I paid close attention to where Smitty's gaze was fixed. There was a circle of coyotes surrounding one of their own at the base of the river. I quickly and calmly stood up, whispered to Smitty that it was time to go, and then proceeded to walk backwards towards the road that led to my house. Keeping my eyes on the coyotes, I made it about 30 yards when all of their heads snapped in my direction, the light reflecting off their eyes. The one in the middle began to stand up on its hind legs, growing over six feet tall and taking on a human shape. We churned and sprinted for home, constantly looking over my shoulder. The pack never moved. I finally made it to my front porch. I looked back to the circled animals, only to find they were no longer there. I went inside, I locked every last door, and I didn't fall asleep until the sun began to rise. Two years ago, I was working with a Native American man, and he told me about the reservation he'd grown up on and a few things he'd seen there. When I recounted to him this story, his eyes went wide. You saw one, he exclaimed. He told me that an encounter like this is rare, but not unheard of. He said it meant that it saw something in me. I hope I don't find out what it wanted from me. Not ever. John. Thanks, John. Interesting to like stack those skinwalker stories together. Now, like mm-hmm. hearing that, I'm like, oh, maybe the first one was a skinwalker. And then what? there were several coyotes in a little like group, right? I guess, yeah. like, I guess pack, yeah. you know, like down there that he was seen too. And uh, I wonder if like those also could have been like little shapeshifters or something. Who knows? Yeah, like such a weird concept to think of like a group of them mm-hmm. around one. Like were they feeding it somehow its energy or like – yeah, like, like, yeah, that is really interesting to think about. Like, like the, the skinwalker could be like the leader of a pack of coyotes. Like, the, I don't know why that's funny to like me. Like, the coyotes are its little minions. Yeah. Yeah. Like, come on, guys. <laughs> Maybe they have to like kind of bark at it a little bit, do their little yells, and then it like gives it the strength to grow. It's like the vampire's familiar. Yeah. Or something. Like, they had like, like numerous little familiars around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who knows? I can't. What's to say they couldn't have that? Yeah. Yeah. That whole like mythology. It's like, uh, and you know, the, Different tribes have different like names that are essentially all just like what a skinwalker is, just like yeah. shapeshifters and things that are like, you know, go between being a human and being mm-hmm. some sort of animal. Yeah. And then there's other cultures, you know, over in Europe and stuff too, like, you know, older cultures that they have stories of like werewolf type again, but it's the same sure. type of thing, just like wild men. Yeah. Like, like wild wild man. Well, it's like like Sasquatch, it's all connected. Yeah. Bipedal creatures that are uh-huh. not quite human. Yes. Yeah. And not not quite animal either. Mm-hmm. I know. And we we have had some stories over the years now of like deer. Uh, you know, like, oh, we thought we saw like, you know, a sickly deer, but then it started to it's always it started to stand up on its hind legs. Mm-hmm. That's when you know, because it seems to me, in our experience with skinwalkers, we generally see them on all fours. We see them as an animal, and then suddenly, yeah, boom, up, two legs, and now half human, half yeah. animal. That moment. I think I would literally piss my pants. Oh yeah, there's no fucking way. Just freak out! I know I'm. I'm having a flashback on like driving past Lapway. You know, on one of the many oh, yeah. drives, like you know, uh, toward Riggins and back. It probably was just in my head. It was after we started the show, so probably just like skinwalkers are just in my head as far yes. as like I'm thinking of that as a concept. Uh huh. All it was was a glimpse of just a deer in the brush. Where I've, you, know, you see, there's so many deer along the highway there. Was it? Uh, but just like the deer along, you know, like by the creek, and I couldn't see the you know, how the ground was shaped beneath the road, just my line of sight. So it could have been like, you know, uh, like it goes down towards the creek, but then maybe it has a little bump. Uh-huh. So it's higher. But the deer's the, the deer's head just seemed too high for where it was standing. And my mind immediately went to Skinwalker. I can't believe you didn't say anything. It was just a little, I mean, but I didn't see anything. I, it, all I saw was a deer's head. So you think? Th- that was probably just a deer, but it's like, uh, I mean, I mean, some of the Skinwalker stories, not this one, but I'm sure some of them are just like, you get thinking about this stuff. Yeah. And then and then you're out there in the woods and sometimes deer, the way they look at you, there is a certain like a uh, aspect to their eyes that it feels extra intelligent, almost yes. human-like, like those doe eyes. I know, which is why yeah. you shouldn't go out and shoot them. Well, they're going to die anyway. Well, let them figure it out. 
I'm, I'm, wait, wait, but we have a freezer full of whitetail that you're still not eating. So like, what was the point? I know, I know. I this is an ongoing battle in our house. I haven't been barbecuing anything this summer. You haven't been barbecuing I, I it. You haven't been the eating guys. the jerky. You haven't brought it to Tyler and Logan. It's been almost a year since you've been <laughs> like, how long can we leave that deer meat in the freezer? I don't know. You guys, how long is deer meat good for? Can I start to toss it? I'll look it up. I'll look it up. Ugh. I just haven't eaten and nobody anything likes in the it. I like it. I just don't want to take the time to make it. And it's really stinky. It makes the stinkiest fucking jerky I've ever smelled in my and entire I, and life. And I've eaten several bags of that jerky and I do like it. Uh-huh. The one time you took out one like white tail salami. I know. And then I forgot about it and got And moldy. then it moldy real fast. I know. I know, dude. I know. You're not meant to be but, a hunter. No, I like it. I, I, just, I just need to slow down a little bit life-wise so I have like time to cook and things. Mm-hmm. I'm too busy all the time. I know. Yeah, Same I know. way. Yeah, we don't, we don't cook very often. We're go, 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 go. I could cook more. Uh, cook, cook up some deer. Ugh. I don't know how to prepare deer and I don't like it's it. Like beef. So it's not like beef. Pre- preparation wise, it is. Is it going to stink? For you, it will. Yeah. No, nope, I'm out. All right. All right. Go, go, get, go get me a bison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go get me an elk. Bison burgers are so good. I'm, I'm down with elk and I'm down with bison. Okay. Okay. So go get one of those guys. So we have way more meat. But I would eat it. We would go through it so fast. Meatballs, uh, mm. bolognese. Sounds hamburgers, uh, meatloaves. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Steaks. Okay. <laughs> okay. Are you ready to hear about this Irish banshee? Yes. Okay, great. Hey, Dan and Lindsay. I grew up in a small town in central Pennsylvania. The town covered less than half a square mile and had a population of just barely over 1,500. Mm-hmm. Not one traffic light. This meant a lot of weird stories were traded back and forth amongst the townspeople to try and spook one another. I never fed into this until I shared an experience with my sister and father. We called it an Irish banshee. Even though I've never looked into the actual lore, I was told my by I was told by my very Irish family that a banshee was an omen of death. They tend to knock three times at the early hours of the morning as a warning that someone you know will soon pass away. And this is exactly what happened to us. It must have been the weekend because my father, sister, and I were up late, sometime around two or three in the morning. I was about 13 or 14, and my sister was 10 years older than me at the time. My sis- uh, my dad is very critically minded, having been in law enforcement for 30 years at this event. He was standing by the front door of our very old house on his way to bed after having some conversation with us about whatever it was he wanted to talk about. In the middle of saying goodnight, we heard three distinct knocks on our porch door. The porch had been enclosed for some time now, well before I was born. We lived on a street next to that, uh, well before I was born because we lived on a street next to not one, not two, but three bars. Don't worry, we had like three times as many churches than a small town needed. And when my parents moved in, it wasn't uncommon for them to have to sweep away a harmless drunkard from the broom with a broom from the front porch. With two small kids, it had made sense to seal it off. Anyways, following the knocks, we all shared a confused look. My dad, leaning by the doorway, peered out to the front door but couldn't see anything. The motion light hadn't gone off, so there was no chance of someone being out there. He opened the front porch door, went outside, looked up and down the street, saw nothing, and came back inside. All clear, nothing to worry about. We all gave a slightly nervous chuckle, but thought nothing more of it. Being an old house, it settled all the time. Creaking and cracking wasn't unheard of. My dad cracked a joke that it was the Irish Banshee and then went to bed. No one lost any sleep that night. The next morning, my dad and I made our way to the car to leave for whatever it was we had going on when our neighbor across the street stopped over to say hello. Again, small town, nothing unusual. She had a concerned look on her face when she asked my dad, did you hear about Sally? Sally was our next door neighbor who had been sick for some time. She'd been in a wheelchair for the last few years after losing her feet to diabetes, and she had been in the hospital every day for dialysis. When our neighbor said that Sally had unfortunately passed away, Although it was sad, it wasn't a shock. My dad and the neighbor finished their conversation and we went on our way. In the car, I asked about Sally's passing, connecting it to the knocking we had heard the night before. A slightly nervous laugh was shared again, but no more thought was given to it. Just a silly little story to tell, right? But then it happened again. A few months later, the same thing happened. This time, the knocks were a loud bang against the porch door that shook the windows of the entire porch. And again, upon investigation, nothing and no one was there. We woke up the next day to hear from that same neighbor that another neighbor had passed away, this time Sally's husband, 
could it really have been an Irish banshee? There have been some other sightings of the Irish banshee, but the sources were often drunks who frequented Mm. those bars by our house and claimed to see a woman, emaciated and pale, with jet black hair, sitting cross-legged under a streetlight and screaming. A creepy image, yes, but coming from someone who is chronically inebriated, eh, I don't know. Sean. (laughs) Thanks, Sean. God, what what a crazy thing to claim to see. Yeah, I mean, you're saying that there at the end, like, the, oh, you know, yeah. like these neighbor, like some emaciated, dark-haired woman sitting under a streetlight, wailing. Guess who's not going out <laughs> drinking and walking home? <laughs> yeah, like, are you kidding me? And the knocking thing. That is super weird. Super weird. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, my brain went to this place of like, maybe you should watch out for that neighbor. Maybe that neighbor killed Sally and Sally's husband knows the folklore of the Irish Banshee and is just like setting it up. Maybe they take advantage of old, like elderly, sick people. Yeah. I'm nervous about the neighbor. Now my brain's going to like a Time Suck episode. Yeah, totally. some, Some serial killer where that's their calling card. That's their MO. Oh my God. Is it they knock three times on the, how creepy is that? I know. Like they go around, like knock three times, and then I can't remember how long it was. Like it's three times. And then I think the next morning there was the next morning. Yeah, the next morning. So you'd have to like knock three times and then kill the person. And well, then- not necessarily. You could just be like plotting it, like, okay, I'm going to kill Sally. You can kill her yeah. and then, then go, go knock. knock. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that you were like, first you have to knock, first then knock. you can commit the murder. And then you got, then you got a short amount of time. You got a quick window of time to get that murder done with. <laughs> You've just got, you know, overnight, 12 hours. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I like those uh, folklore stories because Mm -hmm. I think every religion, community, group of people, whatever, have stories around like omens of death. Yeah. Even if they're not super scary, you know, it can be like, you know, some people think that they have premonition dreams or, you know, like my family strongly believes that all deaths come in three. So like as soon as one person dies, we're all holding our breath waiting for two more. And like, which ones count? Like, you don't know. <laughs> like, if, it, if if you have, like, an aunt or an uncle, like, a close family member pass away, then does it have to be two more of equal value? <laughs> or can it be, like, you know, my brother's friend's dad? Does that yeah. count? I don't know. We've been having this debate in my family for years. I, I like the uh, the concept that, like, you know, like, okay, like, in Irish culture, you know, in certain, you know, like, a uh, certain, I guess, uh, some Irish culture, there's, like, this belief in the banshee mm-hmm. and that you could, like, bring that to America. Because there is this kind of, like, uh, belief of some people. It's, it's, it's almost like, like, thought forms. Like, you can think something into existence. Yeah, like yeah. If, if enough people are thinking about the same creature, they can almost, like, create it. Mm-hmm. And then that thing could, like, follow your group of people. Like, Well, it's kind of like the uh, the Hmong people. Oh, with, yeah. Uh, yes. And I can't remember what the uh, entity is called, but it's, like, it kills them in their sleep. Kind of uh-huh. like, like Freddy Krueger was based off of it. Yeah. But it's specific to that culture. And, um... You know, which like uh, skeptically, you can say like, well, it's just mass hysteria and people are spreading the same folklore, which is getting people worked up and making them see the same things. But another angle could be like, what if because they all thought about the same thing, they somehow willed it into some form of existence and now it's following their culture? Could be. All kinds of possibilities. Oh, the possibilities. Do you have time for one more? I do. Okay, here we go. This, oh yeah, this is like a weird doppelganger story. Mm. I'm very excited to see what you think at the end. Okay. This story has been told in my family for as long as I can remember, and it's something that has always stayed with me. When I was five years old, my mom took me on vacation with her to Mexico for three months to visit relatives. I was very little, so I really don't remember anything. The story goes that my older brother, 14 at the time, was playing outside my grandma's house with my sister, who was 10 at the time, and some friends when my mother announced she was going to the store. She planned on making dinner and needed a few items. She told my brother that I would be staying behind and it was his responsibility to take care of me. The most important rule was that he make sure I didn't wander off into the cornfields next to my grandmother's house. He agreed and then carried me to where he was playing, gave me some toys of my own to play with, and the big kids continued with their games. My brother checked on me every so often, and at some point he saw me get up and started walking towards the fields. He was a bit far away, so he began running towards me, screaming at me to stop but I kept walking. As he got closer, he saw me walk into the cornfields. He started to panic. He, my sister, and their friends were going crazy looking for me in the cornfields. They didn't dare seek out any of the adults for help because they were sure they'd get their asses kicked for losing me. They kept searching for me. Every so often, they would catch a glimpse of me in the cornfields, rush towards me, but when they got there, I'd be gone. After what seemed like hours, they finally decided to go tell someone, even if it meant getting beat. As they started walking towards the house, they saw my mom in the distance, carrying grocery bags under her arms, 
and they saw me, walking right next to her. My brother, full of relief, ran towards me. He apologized to my mom <laughs> for letting me wander into the fields in the first place. My mother was confused. What do you mean? I took her with me. She's been with me this whole time, she explained. That She went on to say that when she tried to leave, I ran after her, crying and wanting to go with her, so she took me with her to the store. And she was certain that she saw my brother see what had happened, so she didn't bother telling my brother that I was going with my mom. This incident remains unexplained, and it freaks me out every time I hear it retold. There were so many people involved, my brother, my sister, their friends, and they all swear that they saw me running into the cornfields when I was actually with my mom. So also, what the fuck? And I mean, seriously, why me? Anonymous. Children of the corn. I know, literally children of the corn. Which, uh, which I don't I, mean, I, I don't even know if I've ever seen that movie. I've, I've seen like pieces, so I don't know yeah. if it has anything to do with it. But I just thought, creepy story. Yeah. Bunch of kids in the corn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that is, a, that is a crazy thing to have multiple witnesses of everybody seeing like, you know, her run out into the cornfield when she could not have been home. Yes. And like, I, for me, like even more bothersome is that the brother... What? Says, like, I picked her up. Yeah, I took her, her over here. I sat her down here. I gave her toys. I was over here playing with my friends, but every so often I'm looking back to check on my little sister. Like, I, he saw her. He didn't just see glimpses of her and think like, oh, shit, did she not go with my mom and now she's in the cornfield? He was responsible for her, touched her. My brain goes to like so scary. weird simulation theory in certain moments oh, like this. Oh, like, yes. Like, like uh, stuff where <laughs> like the game is glitching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Where reality, we're just in some kind of game. And, you know, just like sometimes, you know, uh, what is it? Non-programmable characters, NPCs, I yeah. think is like, like will glitch up in the thing, just like keep repeating themselves or they'll like be walking and they'll just kind of like stop walking, but like do like a weird motion in place. This reminds me I of that. I want you to walk like that. <laughs> They're just frozen like that. This reminds me where there was a glitch where it's like in the game, it's like, yep, supposed to be going with the mom, but yeah. then uh, some programming error led to like a, a, a little secondary like version of this person going with the brother. Yeah. Yeah. Just weird. Yeah, well, it's like maybe, you know, there are multiple versions of us. So in one version of her life, she does go with her mom. It's the multiverse. But in another version of her life, she stays behind. And in another version of her life, not only does she stay behind, but she runs into the cornfields and she goes missing and she dies. Do you know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. there are, I do, I don't know. I, I've gotten more into like that being a possibility because there's just too often that it's like, that is so freaking weird that I can like walk. We were talking, were we talking about that here? Where it's like, sometimes I just like will go somewhere and I swear to God, without any conscious choice, my brain takes me on a completely different path. Yeah. We were talking about that here. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, well, why does that happen? Cause it's, it's not so, like, it's not a story I'm manufacturing for mm -hmm. myself. Right. Right. Something that know. my brain is choosing to do all on its own. We're all in the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes the matrix glitches. Glitchy, glitchy. Okay. Well, I like uh, very different kinds of stories today, which was super fun. Yes. Oh, no, I have bad news. What? My Annabelle shout outs somehow did not print out. Uh -oh. I, I only have four of them. Uh-oh. You have the rest. I have I have 10. Yeah, it's okay. Next week, we'll just do more. Okay, you'll just-, you'll just uh, Yeah, we'll just, I'll figure there out- There we go. Problem I'll, solved. Sorry, folks. That's so weird. They're also out of order. Like, I was like, oh my God, they're not even here. But some of them are here. They're not even where they're supposed to be. Oh, man. How bizarre. No worries. At least one of us is uh, professional. I'll, I want to I thank the following. What? <laughs> I want to just be really passive aggressive. I want to thank the following Annabelles. Like for usual. Oh, boy. That was good. Good way. Toss it back. Uh, for supporting us on, the, on our show here, I'd like to thank Faith Armor, Aaron Smith, Chris King Unicorn Horn. I love him. <laughs> or her. Uh, Ryan Allison. Clay. Michael Floyd, Mary Zellner, Jenny Sloan, Thea Olivia Gonzalez, and Jerry Stone. Oh, oh, there's not, it was Sloan. Jenny Sloan and Jerry Stone. Those are very similar. I know. I noticed that too. And I was like, uh oh, if I give them to him side by side, is he going to make them be a couple? Yeah, maybe. Jenny Sloan and Jerry Stone. I can't, I, I was trying to remind. <laughs> I was waiting for more. I, I know, I, I, was, I was thinking, how can I get to moan? Oh. And then, but it, I felt like the song was going to get real dirty because the only words I could think that rhymed with Stone and Sloan was bone and moan were my first two. And groan. Uh, groan. So I'm like, this is going to take a real. And shown. Porno, porno turn. Lone. They could be lone sharks. <laughs> lone. 
it. I'm trying to help. <laughs> okay, well, I would like to thank my four Annabelle since I am incredibly unprofessional. Incredibly unprofessional? Even better. I don't even know words. I will be fired this when this show ends. So if I'm not here next week, you know why. Uh, and God by Pat, Joshua Snyder, Sharon Lettery, and Jenny Randleman. What is good is mm-hmm. I have the spoopy shout outs. Okay. And those are more time sensitive generally to people. Okay. So, whew. To Penelope V from your mom, Lacey, happy birthday. To Brooke from dad and Brett, happy birthday. To Megan from Kirsten, happy 23rd birthday. To Bo and Bailey from Mama Bear, happy ninth birthday to my little creepers. It's amazing watching you grow into awesome, sassy, intelligent humans. I love you. Keep up that sass. I love it. (laughs) To Scout from Pumpkin, happy 10th anniversary. Thank you for spooking through this beautiful life with me and our little baby creeper. I love you. Oh, very sweet. So, so sweet. Very sweet. And that is our show. Uh, Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Uh, you can email us, as always, for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thank you to Tyler C. Producing, directing, scoring today. Da-dun, da-dun, da-dun. Dun, dun, da-dun. Uh, thanks to Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Book editor Drew Atana for polishing and preparing listener stories for book number five. And thanks to producer Olivia Lee for finding the first story I told this week. And to producer Ashley McAnelly for finding the second. And that is how you say her last name correctly. Uh, I said it correct on the bonus episode. And uh, she sent me a recording of herself saying it. So I would not mess it up again. And I asked for that, by the way. Not not like she was being pushy. I was just like, I I feel like I got it wrong. And I did. So thanks, Ashley. Uh, If you'd like to listen and watch, please subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube. You can also see my special. Trying to get better. You know, there. Uh, Check check that out. Uh, Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. So uh, what I hear you saying is don't watch Scared to Death on YouTube. Put a pause, put a pin in it, and pop over and watch your special. And then come, come watch Scared Death. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. And like and share. Those are the most important pieces. <laughs> uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want pics that accompany episodes at Scared to Death Podcast. Same handle for TikTok. We have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers. Get in there, meet some fellow horror lovers. And if you don't want ads and you do want monthly bonus episodes and more, check out our Patreon. And, uh, you know, Lindsay might get your name in an episode. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you're scared to death. I'll just be over here casting spells on you. Oh. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. Thanks for coming back after like watching his special. Like, <laughs> thanks for coming back to support me. I appreciate it.